the police there have been routinely and systematically harassing and abusing black citizens. You think of Trayvon Martin's and Jordan Davis's deaths. 2014, you have Eric Gardner's death in New York. Then you have Michael Brown's death in Ferguson, George Floyd's death, Ahmaud Arbery's death, Breonna Taylor's death. They don't want to believe the police do anything wrong or could do anything wrong. They don't believe in systemic racism. How do you process the things that you witness because they are traumatic? Um. Hello, I'm Ollie Dugmore, and welcome to Unfiltered. My guest today is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author, whose coverage of the most significant moments in 21st century US history has seen him arrested and tear-gassed. His latest book, American White Lash, provides a nuanced and human account of how the forces of white power retaliated against the presidential victory of Barack Obama, helped propel the rise of Donald Trump, and resulted in multiple racially motivated murders. He says... White fears may be the defining force of our time. And as long as there are elements within our mainstream politics and media willing to cynically play to those fears, we can expect additional bursts of white racial violence, the horrific calling card of our era of American white lash. Wesley Lowry, welcome to Unfiltered. Thanks so much for having me. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm enjoying my time over here on this side of the Atlantic. It is, as we were talking about before, um, it is miserably hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's probably a little bit too much for my uh, for my. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for the full summer, but here but here we are. Yes, rocking the jeans. I went for linen trousers today. <laughs> yes, a, you were wiser than I. <laughs> pushing the boat out a little bit. Um, you spent the majority of your career covering race, law enforcement, and justice. When did you first become aware of the history of race relations in America? Sure. Well, I mean, I think that. This is something that's always been of interest to me, obviously growing up black, uh, but mixed race. Um, my father's black, my mother's white. And so um, there were always, I was always interested in these conversations and so much as they manifested in our society and in the world that we, as we still lived it. Um, the New York Times did a series called How Race Has Lived in America um, when I was younger. And I, that series wasn't what kind of brought me into this, but I always think about that framework, like how race is lived. Mm. The idea that it's a like, social and societal construct. Obviously, it's not a biological reality. It's a thing that we've collectively created, right? And I've always been fascinated in watching and seeing how these, this idea and this construct is lived and lived out. And so um, I, I think what's also true is I knew I wanted to go into the media and become a journalist pretty young. And when I did that and as I explored that, I knew that that there were not a ton of black journalists in many newsrooms. The black journalists were underrepresented in um, in the workforce of people who craft media narratives. And so I was always looking for ways as a black journalist I might help bring stories that other people weren't going to bring um, into our publications. And so because of that, very often those stories ended up having something to do with issues of race and, and ethnicity and justice. And so that kind of always uh, became a, a little bit of a calling card of some of the work that I did. So it's fair to say then from an early age, you weren't just conscious about politics and issues of race, but also politics within the media and the politics of race within the media. Of course. Yeah, definitely. Were you discussing these issues around the breakfast table when you were younger? What was it like in your household? Sure. I think my dad and I, my dad, uh, my dad is in journalism as well. And so he, him and I would talk about this a fair amount. He was involved um, at some of the newspapers and television stations where he worked in their newsroom diversity efforts um, and in thinking about how do you build and construct newsrooms that are reflective of the country and the world that we're trying to accurately cover. Um, and so I know that those were, you know, some of those conversations, I mean, some of that was explicit conversation. Some of it I probably just got through osmosis and environmental, right? Um, but then also I got really involved in organizations like the National Association of Black Journalists and other organizations where we talked about a lot of those issues a lot, even when I was kind of young and coming up. So when you were deciding to be a reporter, did you feel like it was a calling? Was there something deeper motivating you to get towards it? I mean, I think in a very simple sense, I always say that, you know, I remember I worked for my middle school newspaper, my high school newspaper, and at some point there was this idea that it dawned on me or occurred to me that I could wake up in the morning with a question, spend all day calling people who are smarter than me, asking them that question, at the end of the day, write down what I learned, and that could be my job. And that just seemed like cheating. Mm -hmm. I mean, it didn't seem like, it's like someone could pay me to just have questions and then ask people them. And so I was like, all right, I want to do that. Yeah. I think for me, you know, I'm someone who learns from people, from talking. I'm someone who really enjoys uh, sitting across from someone and building a relationship with them um, and building like, an intimate connection with someone. 
And so the idea that that's something I could just do um, as a means of understanding the world just, I mean, like I said, just seems so exciting to me. And so um, I can't imagine spending my time doing anything else. From what I understand, you wanted to become a political reporter. Yeah, that's kind of what I started with. I mean, part of that's from the times that I came up, right? That I was in high school during the George W. Bush years. And so uh, you see a lot of activism um, and and kind of grassroots energy around any number of issues, whether it be the, the response to Hurricane Katrina, whether it be the the invasion of Iraq, whether it be the failure to take action on climate change. I grew up in Ohio, which was at the time one of the key swing states in America. And so these set of social issue fights over abortion or gay marriage, those were, those were issues that kind of we were drowned in, in terms of how much was happening. And and then, you know, I went off to college and voted in my first election in 2008, um, right, at a time of kind of an ascendant black president. And so you saw the reporters who gained these followings, who people were paying attention to, were these political reporters who were on the trail covering Barack Obama or, uh, or John McCain and Hillary Clinton and then Mitt Romney, right? And and they were, you know, we had these new technologies like Twitter, so they're tweeting from all of the, you know, all the political rallies. And so to be a political journalist just seemed like the sexiest job in the game. And so, of course, it's what I wanted to do. It seemed really cool, you know? <laughs> That's the first time I've heard political reporting. Oh, no, I was, like, obsessed with these people. I mean, it just, the work they got to do, it just seemed really cool to be, yeah. get to be at all these places. And everyone on the country is following your, your Twitter feed to see what Barack Obama said today. And, I, you know, I just, it was very hard to come up and come into journalism at that time and not really admire those mm. folks i think perhaps maybe as well there's a slightly an atlantic divide with the political system in britain perhaps being slightly less i don't know magisterial or prestigious the <laughs> idea of i don't know being uh but, but well, we're, we're catching like, we're catching up we're, this, was in, the, this was in the past <laughs> this was in the past right we're, we're talking about 2008 Sorry, we're, we're not 2000, talking about 2018 right? <laughs> <laughs> um you're reporting <sighs> a transition towards covering race and justice. Um, was there a specific event or a specific moment that, that led you in that direction? Sure. So, you know, I, I came up and, you know, I I did kind of the normal building blocks of a career covered, you know, was an intern in a lot of places, covered cops and courts and was on the Metro beat and then got to City Hall, was covering local politics in Boston for the Boston Globe. And from there went to the Washington Post to cover Congress, uh, which was a, honestly, I think anyone going to Washington or anyone trying to cover national politics in the states should start with Congress. I think there's a ton that can be learned uh, from reporting at that level. But um, about midway through my year covering Congress, there was a police shooting in Ferguson, Missouri, um, of a man named Michael Brown, 18-year-old named Michael Brown. And... Um, I always had been looking for issues of justice, of race, of things to cover. At the time, the Republicans controlled the House, and that was the big story in Capitol Hill. And I was like this young black guy, and I, I couldn't really compete with the the, um, the the Republican sourcing some of my other colleagues had for any number of reasons. And so I was, in a lot of ways, covering the Democrats right, and trying to cover stories that weren't getting as much attention, um, but always looking for, okay, is there something to do on voting rights? Is there something to do on justice? Something, what's going on with the NAACP? And so when this police shooting happened... I raised my hand, got sent to Missouri, thought I was going to go for about three days, ended up staying in Missouri for about three months, um, spent as much time on the ground there as I think just about any other national reporter. And then for the years that followed, recrafted my beat to be much more of a national correspondent role covering issues of race and policing in the United States um, and helping um, work on a team at the Washington Post where we tried to do these big kind of data projects to collect information and to publish information explaining what was going on in the country, that we had this massive national debate happening that very often was happening uh, without a lot of context, without a lot of access to real information. And it was this kind of political silly game as opposed to actual, you know, substantive debate. And it was that work for the Washington Post that won you the Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. um, just for, for a British listener, would you be able to talk give us the what in relation to Michael Brown because in the States Ferguson it's more than just a place name that that word evokes something much deeper now doesn't it sure well so you know so this was a so you, you think about this kind of era and this era that gives rise to the Black Lives Matter movement or the movement for Black Lives however you want to uh, distinguish it in the States at least right you think of a few pivotal events you think of Trayvon Martin's and Jordan Davis's deaths in 2012 um, you think of the uh, acquittal of George Zimmerman for the death of Trayvon Martin. You think about 
the film Fruitvale Station, which depicts Oscar Grant's death. That had happened in 2009, but the, the film comes out in 2013, around the time of the George Zimmerman acquittal. 2014, you have Eric Gardner's death in New York. Uh, then you have Michael Brown's death in Ferguson. Uh, this was a young man um, who was shot and killed by a police officer in suburban St. Louis. Um, his body was allowed to lay out in the street for several hours, um, and there was very little uh, discussion or very little detail provided as to what happened. You know, ultimately, this would become this massive case that was investigated both locally and federally. There was a big debate about whether or not he had been surrendering at the time when he was shot, or his hands up, or they not. Um, and and so there was this this massive kind of. Uh, debate over what was happening in this case. You know, ultimately, the investigators concluded that, one, they didn't have great evidence in one direction or the other, but that it was more, more likely than not that the most sympathetic version of what happened to Michael Brown is not what happened, that he wasn't surrendering with his hands up, but that the police there had been routinely and systematically harassing um, and, and abusing black citizens, which helped us explain why there was such a depth of distrust as well as uh, why there was such a vitriolic reaction to this shooting and then this, and then this young man being left in the street. From Ferguson to in Michael Brown, you go back to my hometown in Cleveland, Ohio, you have Tamir Rice's death, um, and then Freddie Gray's death, and Sandra Bland's death, and Philando Castile's death. Um, and, and we kind of, it, these things keep piling until we get then to 2020, where we, we obviously see the eruption of emotion, anger, protest, energy around George Floyd's death, Ahmaud Arbery's death, Breonna Taylor's death, right? And so these moments are never quite moments. They're all stacking together, and you see this momentum that builds over time. And, you know, it was unique. You know, I considered it a privilege and a responsibility that I was one of the national reporters whose job it was to cover not just one of these, but kind of all of them in succession over the course of all of these years and to try to understand and grapple with what all of this means. You mentioned in one of your previous answers as well that the nature of your work being different to perhaps your white colleagues. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to talk a little bit more about the importance of other black journalists in acting as a support network for you and helping you with your reporting? Certainly. You know, I think that I think that having that community is really important. I actually think that when I first started on these beats and covering these stories, I wish I could go back and lean more heavily on on that support system. And something I try to do very proactively now and today is is lean on my friends, my colleagues, the folks who are in this work with me who understand what's going on. I think that I think it's very hard to explain to someone what it's like to cover such vitriolic topics in such a politicized world that are fundamentally about your own humanity, right? When the person who's dead in the street could be your brother, could be your father, could be you, right? When you are receiving the incoming from the readers and the viewers, um, when every word you are writing is being combed over by these political partisans in every direction to advance conspiracy theories about what you want and what you believe and what you're trying to do. And meanwhile, they're trying to show up every day and just do your job correctly, right? To shed light on what's happening, to ask questions that need answers. Um, it can be really difficult. And it can be really difficult to do that in this kind of 24-hour digital online space, to do it at the time. I mean, Ferguson happened, I was 23, 24 years old. Uh, you know, it, it can you make as many mistakes as, as you as you do correct decisions. And so a lot of that can be really tough. Um, for me, my community of other black journalists has just been so key and so important, um, in part because there are folks who are co-laborers in that work with you, who understand what's going on, who are going through similar things. Uh, who can support you and who get you and who see you, who communicate just in the same language as you, right? Um, and so I think it's it's so important. Um, and I think that, and then beyond that, and so I think it's one of the reasons I try to, when I can, pay that forward further, right? When there are young black journalists coming up behind me, whatever I can do to be a support system or help them out or put my foot on the scale in their favor, it's always something I'm going to want to do because there are so many people who try to do that for me as well. And that the context of that, the, the people analyzing your work and looking in a way to make you a part of the story. And I guess as a journalist, that's really the last thing that you want. You're there to observe, to report, to document. The last thing you want is to become sort of the main character in whatever it is you're talking about. Certainly, and, and, but, but yet you see this. You know, when people don't like a story, one of the key ways to discredit it is to attack the messenger of the story, right? And so we would see this very frequently, that there was, that there were 
political forces who were disinclined and who remain disinclined. They do not want to believe that there is prejudice and racial prejudice in our society. They don't want to believe that there are changes or reforms or steps that still need to be taken. They don't want to believe the police do anything wrong or could do anything wrong. They don't believe in systemic racism. They don't, right? But beyond that also, there is an interpersonal prejudice that is that is woven into any amount of criticism, right? That, that the reality is uh, one of the reasons our female colleagues receive certain vitriol is because people hate women, <laughs> right? In the same way, the, the reason that your black colleagues are the ones getting yelled at all the time by all these crazy people on the internet is because of racism, right? And, and, that, and that's not to deflect all criticism. That's not to say that mistakes are never made, right? But it's the sense of there is a, a magnified level of scrutiny, um, of bad faith mm. that is just very different uh, than is experienced by other colleagues. Um, and, and it can be hard to explain. It's also crazy making, right? Because here you are in this bunker receiving all this incoming and everyone else is like, well, why are you so upset? What's going on? And you're like, what, what are you people talking about? <laughs> and so it's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's really tough. It, it, it can be really tough. Um, as you said, when you are the journalist, you don't ever want to become the story or be thrust into it. Um, but what's also true is I think that enemies of journalism and, and people who do not want us to have a, under, a factual understanding of what is true recognize that if they can try to make the journalist the story, if they can try to call into question a journalist, uh, that can be a means at which they distract uh, from what's actually happening. And so we see this time and time again, uh, certainly with black journalists on these issues, is these vitriolic attacks on the individual as a means of trying to discredit the work that the individual has done. My friend Nicole Hannah Jones deals with this all the time. My friend Tanahasi Coates deals with it all the time, right? The, the, we have journalists who the debate or the quote unquote controversy is not about their work almost at all, but now they are a quote unquote controversial person. And so it's a means of trying to discredit and undermine the work that they're doing. You uh, mentioned earlier that you first voted in 2008 mm -hmm. and you open American White Lash with your memories of election night. Um, mm -hmm. What did you see in Barack Obama as president? And, and could you talk a little bit more about that moment for America? A few things are true. I mean, look, Barack Obama is one of the most talented politicians any of us um, has ever seen, either in person, much less. I mean, it, he's one of the most talented politicians in probably the history of humanity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just in terms of his ability to communicate, um, his the, the way with which he can wield rhetoric and inspire. Um, he captured a desire. I think about this all the time. As citizens, as voters, as residents, we want to support candidates. We want to support leaders in any capacity, right? who lay out a vision and a narrative of ourselves that we want to believe to be true, right? Mm. Uh, and, and what Barack Obama did is he laid out, both in his rhetoric, but also just in his reality of who he was, a vision of America that America wanted to be real. We wanted to overcome the darkest depths of our history. We wanted to be a place where a black guy with a funny name could become the president of the United States, right? Because what would that say about us? Yeah. It would say very good things about us, right? So that's what we want. And, and so you see why he's able to build a coalition of people who were able to gr agree on the shared desire of who we are and what we are, right? And I think that in that moment, though, I think it tricked a fair number of people, not everyone, and there were certainly people who knew and said this in real time, but, but, it, but it tricked a fair number of people into imagining, um, in some ways, to believing American marketing, <laughs> right, beyond, you know, beyond what was a reasonable um, analysis of, of what reality was, right? Are we going to enter a post-racial society, and are we going to... But in fact, what we saw were a few things. First is that we saw, there's been studies that have been done on this, and I, I, I need to look up if they've ever been done on race. I know they've been done on gender, where they've done studies where they've looked at um, countries where a woman has been elected, and how in the years that follow, uh, there in fact is often an, an increase in misogyny, uh, because people now believe as if they have permission, right? Well, I can't be a sexist, I voted for, uh, I voted for her. <laughs> But let me tell you about those women, right? Like, right? And yeah, yeah. and having 
lived it and experienced it, I, I might suggest that I think something similar may have happened, right? It's like now everyone had a black friend. His name was Barack Obama, right? Mm-hmm. But let me tell you about, and so you saw some of that. But secondarily, you know, what we saw was a, this was a real pivot point in our, in our history, right? Not necessarily entering something new, but rather, I think, marking the, the end or the continuation of something that had been happening, that America had been in this fight and this grapple about whether or not we were going to be a multiracial democracy. Um, that, you know, for the majority of our history, we were kind of an explicitly white supremacist nation. Um, then there's a period over time where we're an explicitly apartheid state, where white people have certain rights, black people have a different set of rights. And then in the late 60s, we, under law, become a multiracial democracy. Everyone ostensibly has the same rights. And that finally leads to uh, the ability of a black man to become elected president. Um, But I think that one of the mistakes we make is when we look at American history or look at a contemporary American world and we believe that multiracial democracy is a given, right, is something that is just the way it is, the way it's always been, the way it always will be. But rather this is as opposed to being something that was hard fought and earned. And so what we see when the cause of multiracial democracy scores such a win and a victory in the election of a black man to become the president, you have people who would oppose it, who, who see this as a drastic, horrifying step. Secondarily, you see people who, you know, were beneficiaries of an unjust system previously, who even if all this is is the resettling back to a, to a norm or to an equality, all they can sense and feel is that they have now lost something they once had. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's true, not just even of like, not, I'm not even talking about like a vowed racist. I'm, not, I'm just talking about normal people who sense the world and the society is changing and I used to be maybe benefited in one way and maybe I'm not going to be benefited in that way anymore. And it's very human and natural for there to be a vitriolic response to that. Mm. Now, there are people who are avowed racist, who are, se- who are excited about the fact that now you have all of these anxious white people who are concerned that the world is changing. Because they say, oh, well, let me tell you about the immigrants and let me tell you about the refugees and let me tell you about the... And so what we've seen in this moment has been an explicit white supremacist movement that has taken advantage of the fact that so much of our politics is now so anxious and in many cases so irresponsible in its rhetoric. Mm. And that, and they've used that to proselytize people and, and to draw them into these extremely dark, violent ideologies that time and time again had led to the deaths of, of Jewish Americans, black Americans, Muslim Americans, Hispanic Americans, immigrants, refugees, um, and this, in this era of kind of increased white racial violence. I think it's really important to highlight that point that when you talk about white lash, you're not talking about people getting into arguments on Twitter. You no. are talking <laughs> about real world, racially motivated violence, murder against normal people. Could you define for the listener what you mean by white lash explicitly? Sure. Right. And so when I'm talking about, so for example, when I talk about white supremacists in this context, right, I'm not talking about it colloquially. I'm not talking about how we say, okay, well, standardized testing may have a root in and, and and to be clear, I'm not suggesting that I don't even believe those things, mm. right? Like, it, like there's a there's a, a space for those discussions, um, and I think there's a there's a real, um, I think if you have a real understanding of how systemic and structural racism work, you either you can argue that these things are white supremacists. But what I'm talking about is literal white supremacists, avowed racists, people who believe there are biological differences between the races, who want America to be a white ethno state, who want a race war, who want to expel immigrants and refugees and black people who believe in anti-Semitic uh, tropes uh, and, 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 um, and conspiracies. And as we think about and talk about those people, right, what we've seen in this moment is an increased level of white agitation at a time when we have had, we are now post-black presidency, when we have census predictions that are suggesting that we are approaching a day when we will be a majority racial minority country, right? That, and yet we have a majority white population that sees all of these things changing and sees itself falling under threat or its way of life falling under threat and is lashing out violently, right? And so when I'm talking about white lash in this capacity, I'm not just talking about 
the increased levels of agitation, which, which is true and which we have there, right? I'm not even just talking about the radicalization or the reactionary response from much of white America, which is also certainly true there as well. I'm talking specifically about what is downstream of those things, which is that we have a white supremacist movement that is seizing on that moment, seizing on all those factors to get more people to commit more acts of violence against people who are different than them. That in this moment, we have people who are losing their lives, who are falling victim to violence per perpetrated by white supremacists explicitly or for the explicit purpose of attempting uh, to defend what they imagine is a genocide of their race, right? And I think the reason it's important to look at that, to talk about this not just in an academic sense or a philosophical sense, but in terms of the actual violence, is that there are real victims, right? That when we demonize immigrants and refugees, when we demagogue about the changes that are happening in our cities or our universities, right? What we see is, sure, many people, perhaps the far major most majority of people can understand when something is political rhetoric or is going too far, but there was always going to be a subsection of people who take the things we say literally. And what I would suggest in this moment of increased white racialized anxiety, that number of people is increasing and is growing. And so there's a real danger in the way that so much of our politics demagog uh, demagogues and demonizes and that has led to people, innocent people, losing their lives. And, and that if we are going to be living in this moment, it felt for me as a journalist that part of my responsibility was to record some of the stories of those people. When did you start to conceptually tie that violent political ideology? And I think it's important to be clear as well, it's resurgence. It's not as if it's, it's a novelty, right? Mm -hmm. but, but it's resurgence and the election of Barack Obama. So it was interesting was I... You know, I wrote a book, They Can't Kill Us All, that came out in 2016, November 2016, so right after Donald Trump was elected. And when you write a book, everyone begins asking you, so what's the next book? What are you working on next? Right? Which is miserable because you just labored through a book and you don't want to ever think about writing again. It's my last question of this. Yeah, yeah no, thank you one. for that. <laughs> uh, the, um, but, uh, but so here we were. It's 2016. Donald Trump has been elected. I've just finished writing a book about the rise of Black Lives Matter as a protest movement. And... Thinking, and so I'm already thinking about the next season. What's next for this movement? What's next for these issues? Donald Trump has been elected, and I start seeing these stories in the news, whether it's white supremacists who are rallying outside the inauguration and, and doing the Nazi salutes, a Muslim woman who's attacked in Portland um, on a train, right? Uh, Charlottesville, Tree of Life, right? These stories, and I'm covering some of them, not all of them, I'm covering some of them. And it became very clear to me that the next chapter, the next season of the story was going to be about a diametrically opposed movement. I'd spent all this time covering the anti-racist movement, but what about the racist movement that now felt empowered? That if, what, if part of what Barack Obama's presidency did was it empowered these young black people to demand more, what would an openly nativist president do? How would that empower white supremacists to want more, to believe as if they had a seat at this table, um, and, and to carry out their violent acts? And so I began looking at it just in the context of the Trump administration. But I, I remember talking to Ibram Kendi and a few other people very, very early on as I'm still conceptualizing. And I remember Ibram noting to me, he said, you know, well, but really you got to stretch that back into the Obama years, right? If Trump is in many ways a response to Obama, how can you look at this just and, and I thought that was I thought that was smart. And so as I so I began looking and saying, well, can I start looking at this conversation at the beginning of the election of a black presidency? It's because it's not as if the light switch flips the day Donald Trump is elected, right? These things have been building. And in fact, the movement that helps propel Donald Trump into office, right, builds over the course of this two year a two-term Obama presidency. And so I kind of, you know, I really started looking, about, looking at this and asking these questions in 2016 and began reporting on these issues and covering some of them and conceptualizing and, um, you know, really began putting pen to paper around 2018, 2019. Obviously, the pandemic comes in there and, um, you know, but I've spent a fair amount of time uh, most of the Trump years thinking about this question and watching and observing and seeing what happened. And on that point about a groundswell of energy and activism, uh, in the book you refer to BLM as this as a new era in the racial justice movement. In your mind, how does BLM draw from but also differ to pre the previous sort of iterations of the racial justice movement? 
Well, look, I think that I think that the racial justice movement, the anti-racism movement, broadly at ten thousand feet, in the biggest possible ways, the United States of America has always fought for the humanity, equality, equity of black people, right? The the in the abolitionist movement, the argument that literally that black people are people, right? Yep. In the civil rights movement, the argument uh, that black people are citizens, they deserve full and equal rights, mm -hmm. right? And, and now we are now in an era um, where it's an argument that black people, uh, in some ways it's almost a back to the future, it's still this argument that, that black people by our society must be valued in the same ways, right? There needs to be an equity of opportunity um, in pursuit of an equity of outcome, right? The, this idea that, um, that we have so many structures and systems in our country that serve... Uh, that, that, that produce outcomes that are so inequitable and that that is a means of devaluing black life, right? Um, and, that these, and that these are holdovers from a time when we constructed these systems, when we did not believe black people were human, when we did not believe that when, when black people under law were not fully citizen. And so it's how do we get rid of what remains from those? And so... And so I see the movement as it exists today and as, as I covered it as a continuation of, of the anti-racist movement as it's always existed in the United States of America. I think that some of what is different is that unlike pr some previous iterations, there is a much broader understanding of the failure of the kind of individualized leader, right, that this is a more diffuse um, and leaderful, not leaderless movement, right? Where there are many people doing work in many different places, as opposed to a more, this idea that everyone is, is is rallying around any type of singular figure. Now, this again, that was never actually quite true. Our understanding of history is always a little oversimplified, right? But I think that's obviously a big part of it. I think that there is a better and different understanding of how the intersection of identities. Uh, compounds injustice and oppression, right? And, and so very often there can be a centering of people who, um, or at least an understanding of how a black woman's experience may be different than a black man's experience or a black gay man's experience might be different than a straight black man's experience or a queer black woman's, right? Like all these things, an understanding of the, the complexities of identity. Um, but then also a fight against, and, and I think this is part of what's so difficult is that so much of what's being fought now is so much less explicit, right? That, that it, it's why we see, you know, you, you see this in the legal scholars and Derek Bell um, and Kimberly Crenshaw and others, the, the, the development of what is properly understood as critical race theory, not the way people use the term, right? But what, it, what it actually is, right? Mm -hmm. This sense of how racial prejudice can embed itself into otherwise race neutral language and statute, right? How, mm. how in the past, very often, a fight was against something that was explicitly and proudly racist, right? A law that says someone is subhuman if they look like this, or a law that says this type of person cannot vote, right? While today's battles are more often than not not against explicit racism in this way, right? But rather against structures and systems that perpetuate unequal status quos, right? Now that can be a lot harder because there's more room to debate, well, this isn't racist, right? Or this isn't a problem, or this isn't a, right? That you're upset about the outcome, not actually about the, the statute, right? But I think that that is particularly, like I said, I think it's particularly difficult. And so, it's, it's been fascinating. You know, it's been a real privilege to get to, as a journalist and a storyteller, get to know many of the people on the front lines of these fights and involved in, in these fights, um, to witness with my own eyes a lot of the moments that have really mattered in all of this. But, um, yeah, it's a, we're like in a remarkable moment in our history. Um, I think what's also true is we have, because of the internet, because of maybe like the genetic testing and other technological advances, right? We have an ability to understand our history that's different than we've had it before, to interrogate things in ways that are different, even to know where we come from, or like, you know, that we're in a moment that is unlike any other moment before. And I think that's been, that's added a fascinating element to mm. all of this. To tie this back to uh, Ferguson, as we were talking about earlier, did you get a sense that 
the response there, and for for want of a better word, wasn't normal. Quotes that that the response in this in- instance was different, and that it would come to be viewed as kind of the starting point that would usher in this change in the movement and the chain the change in protest. I think it was very clear. I think I said so much at the time. It was clear in real time that this was a moment that had staying power. We reach these breaking points where people, where there's indignity that stacks itself over time. And finally, people say, all right, enough is enough. This is where I'm drawing the line. And it was just extremely clear in 2014. We are now in the second term of a black president. It was very clear that for a lot of black Americans are saying, this is where I'm drawing the line. This stops. This has to stop. Something has to be done. And so it was unsurprising to me when that story went from one place to the next to the next. It was just very clear that, um, that we had reached a pivotal moment in the zeitgeist in terms of what people are willing to put up with. And you were arrested during your reporting sure. there, during the quote, quote unquote, unrest. Mm-hmm. Um, and you mention you describe being arrested alongside sort of elderly women. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the police's attitude, not just to the protesters, but also to the media? You know, one thing that's true is almost any time you have mass protest, you see mass arrest in one way or the other, right? And I spent enough time on the ground in these types of incidents to, in a lot of ways, have a fair amount of sympathy for police because it's, it's not particularly easy to police these massive demonstrations that I've, I've been there. I've watched any number of times where something is really violent and then it's very peaceful, then it's really violent again and back and forth and things change within moments, right? But what I think is also true is that we have to, whenever we talk about the press and the press being uh, ha- having its rights infringed upon during protest, I think it's important for us to remember that at least in the United States, our, the First Amendment that protects the work that we do is the same First Amendment that protects the demonstrators and the protesters who are there, right? And so anytime we're talking about members of the media being arrested, we also need to take into consideration the citizens who are arrested, in many cases, in just as, just as arbitrary of circumstances, um, and in many cases, for doing nothing but exercising their same First Amendment rights. And so uh, when I was in Ferguson, you know, I spent, I said, many, many nights in the streets uh, covering demonstrations. And it was, there was a, a real arbitrariness to what are the rules in a given night? Where can you stand? Where can you go? What should you be doing? How do you... And, and on many of these nights, people, you know, you could tell the individual officers just become overwhelmed and start making decisions that, are, you know, very often are not wise ones about what to do and, and how to handle things. And and it, it speaks to, I think, the complication of these moments. But then, like I said, what I think is also true is, you know, myself and my friend Ryan Riley, the Huffington Post, we were the first two, to our knowledge, we were the first two journalists arrested in Ferguson. And over the course of the nights to follow, dozens of other journalists were arrested. Hundreds of people were arrested, right? At the demonstrations and protests over the years, all types of journalists were arrested. And, um, and, and I think that, again, one... We need to, so in the states, we need to respect the rights of our press to document what's happening. I think it's of the utmost importance. But second, I think we have to question any time we're talking about journalists being arrested, we have to say, okay, well, who else was taken into custody here? And for what? Because if the police will do this to us, what are they willing to do to someone who has even less power than we have? And, and so I think that anytime I, try to, anytime I talk about my arrest, I always want to try to make sure to remind myself, remind others, and recenter the hundreds of other people who were taken into custody, many of whom did not have high-powered corporate attorneys to get them out of trouble, right? Um, yet whose arrests were likely just as justified based on just as little, which is to say no <laughs> evidence um, or probable cause, um, and so it's just something always worth considering. I note in that answer, your, well, it's a selfless answer, your intention to remove the personal from it and talk about the broader issues, the broader structural issues. But I'd just like to probe that a little bit further, sure. if I may. Um, these events, particularly in Ferguson, but throughout everything that you've covered, mm-hmm. they're intense, they are emotive. And to talk about you for a second, as a journalist, how do you process the things that you witness? Because they are traumatic. They are. I think that 
Um, you know, I, for years at the Washington Post, I had a really wise editor named Cameron Barr, uh, who just announced he's leaving the Post. He was the number two editor there. Um, but he used to talk about this idea that the more emotional the story, the less emotional the reporter. And and that was something I I try to cling to and think about over the years. I'm, I'm certainly prone to getting spun up and, you know, and, and I'm, I'm very human. But um, I think that for me, one of the things I think about is that when something terrible happens, no matter what it is, um, for so many years, we would open social media and we'd see another video. We wouldn't even know what, you know, like it's just, it seemed like every time you opened your phone for a set of years, it'd be another. You watch it and there'd be this moment of, I want to do something. Right? It's very human. I see something, and I don't like it. I want to do something about it. And I think the power of being a journalist is that in that moment, there is something for me to do. And I can pick up a phone. I can call folks. I can gather context. I can probe for information. I can compile it, and I can help everyone else understand what happened. So in that moment, I don't have to feel helpless. I don't have to feel untethered. It's important, and I've worked on this over the years, it's important to still create and take space to personally, emotionally process. Everything can't become a work process, right? Um, and that's something that I've, like I said, I've really worked on, uh, taking time to feel my own feelings about, about some of this stuff and not intellectualize all of it. But there's something about being in a position where in moments where you're viewing injustice, having something you can do. Um, and, and that thing being empowering other people to understand what's happening and to take action themselves. And so I think for me, that's been something I've really focused on a lot over the years is that in moments when my communities or our country face something difficult, how can I, to whatever extent possible, use whatever skills and talents I have to help us collectively process and push forward to something better. Um, and that's obviously, I think, a little, you know, I don't want to say like pie in the sky or like holier than that. You know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's big and like values driven and aspirational, right? And, and, and lofty, in a, you know, when the actual work is much messier than that and complicated than that, right? But... You know, as someone who does, you know, I couldn't do this work if I didn't believe in the power of the public square, the power of discourse, the power of language and communication and words. If I didn't believe in the power of us to see things that don't work and fix them and make them better, right? Um, and so for me, I don't know what else I would do. I don't know that I could have made it through these, these years of watching these horrible things happen time and time again if I didn't feel as if there wasn't some way to contribute uh, in some ways making them better. So on that point, you're talking about yourself contributing. In April, you penned an essay for the Columbia Journalism Review about the objectivity of the US press, in which you critiqued the ability of the press to cover these issues justly. Why do you think the US press has failed in that sense? I think that there was a line, I was actually glancing back at that essay over breakfast this morning briefly for something. Um, but there's a line in there where, where I write about how I think one of the f reasons that the press in the United States has not been able to do the work necessary to champion and defend multiracial democracy is that in practice, the United States press hasn't believed in multiracial democracy. That you look around our newsrooms and we don't reflect the complexity and diversity of the world that we live in, that our coverage doesn't reflect it, that we are slaves in a lot of ways to... American capitalism, to subscribers, to traffic, to advertisement dollars, that we are attempting to appease the theoretical reader, and we always imagine that reader to be an upper middle class white guy, right? Uh, that so much of our ingrown sensibility um, is not reflective of our country. I think that sometimes we focus as much on being trusted as we do as on telling the truth. And I think when you sacrifice one for the other, you end up with neither of those, right? Um, and, 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 and that's not to understate how difficult those problems and those questions are, right? But what do you do if you've got a sizable portion of the population that doesn't believe the sky is blue? You face a choice. Do you pull your punches and 
tweak your language in a way to not offend the, the blue sky deniers? Or do you tell them the truth about the color of the sky, knowing that your trust rating will go down? And, and that's like obviously a funny example, but we literally have no, for sure. a, a non-insignificant subsection of people who believe that the person who won the election did not win the election. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then meanwhile, in the press, we're going, well, no one trusts us. What are we supposed to do? Well, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to tell the truth, knowing that there are a bunch of people who are politically opposed to the truth? Or are we going to try to get those people to trust us again? Because, mm -hmm. because what is the trade-off required of those things? And, and I think first and foremost, our, our biggest responsibility as a press is to tell the truth, whether it's believed or not, right? I think, that's, I think sometimes it's liberating, almost easier to be a black journalist in, or in the tradition of black journalism because, because for better or worse, black journalists have never been believed. And so, there, so it's easy. Ida B. Wells did not write about lynching believing she was going to end lynchings, right? Like, uh, not that I don't think she would have aspired to that or wanted it or that she had any lack of clarity about the evil, right? But it was not, I'm going to write the article that finally fixes it, right? She was never under this kind of naive pretense that I think sometimes in journalism we can be under, right? Mm. That our work itself is going to solve all the problems, right? What I think black journalists have always understood is that our job is to accurately, accurately document what is happening so that the future will know what was true here, even if the people here denied it, right? And I think that's part of what's been so difficult for our industry has been this idea of why don't people trust us? Why don't people believe us? Should we contort ourselves? Should we do something? Should we? And, and I might argue that our job is to write down true things, whether we lose all the subscribers or people are mad or people are upset. Um, and and I, I, I think that, that um, you know, unfortunately, I think that we spend so much time obsessed with how we're being perceived, trying to solve for how to be inoffensive to people who are professionally offended or dispositionally politically offended that we then undermine our ability to do the thing we're supposed to be doing anyway, which is just telling people the sky is blue. Yeah, and I guess the, the important point as well is that people will vote, not that they won't just believe it, they will vote for the person that tells them the sky is red. Um, Correct. And, and, and if we don't, and then, and then we'll invent, re, they will decide that because we've written the sky is blue, that we can't be trusted on any issue. And, mm. and our, again, our job is not to try to figure out how to make those people trust us. Our job is to show up and write down that the sky is blue. Mm -hmm. um, you've previously said on this subject, this is a quote, I'm not seeking balance because objective reality is not balanced. Why for you does objectivity not also mean neutrality or balance? Let's think about these words, right? Let's think about, um, it, it, if I write about a murder, which I do very often, if I, if I write about a murder, you should not walk away from my writing confused as to whether or not the murder was a good thing or a bad thing, right? Um, now, just the person who the prosecutor said did the murder may not have done the murder, Right. There's mm -hmm. a fairness and a complexity and a rigor, but there should not necessarily be a neutrality. It is bad that someone was murdered. Right. Of course. The the um, it is currently not raining in London. Right. My weather report does not actually require or need a balance between people who believe it is raining and people who do not believe it is raining. Mm -hmm. It is not raining. Right. And, and so th then again, objectivity is about reflect the reflection of objective reality. Right. While balance very often creates it, 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 by, by its very nature, cr seeks to create something artificial to take things that are separate and, and to even them out. Right. Now, look, there are questions in our society that are unsettled. Right. And I think in cases like that is important to reflect the nuances and complexities of those debates. I think it's important in a journalistic process to talk to as many people as possible, to understand and be able to represent different people's different viewpoints, right? But I think so often in the production of news, in the actual how the sausage is made each day, it can become a paint by the numbers. Oh, well, we've got a Republican here, so we need a Democrat to, to make sure that they're both voices are right. We pretend as if there are two sides when there are really 800 sides or we create a conflict on a point where there actually isn't conflict on this point. There's or we emphasize the conflict by the desire to reflect the the different sides. We emphasize the conflict points as opposed to the 80 percent where everyone agrees. Right. So I think there's any number of problems inherent to seeking 
balance, to seeking neutrality, to seeking, right? We see ourselves tripping over ourselves in euphemism, right? Where we won't just say what happened because we don't want someone to argue that what we could have said was, and I think that our job more often is to just in plain spoken language, tell people what we know, tell people what we found out, tell people what's true and, and, and figure out what's there and what's not. And I, and I think that there's a, um, and, and again, I think that we get in our way. I, I think that I actually think very often the steps that we take, the ways we contort ourselves trying to seek the, the trust is the, thing, the very thing that proves us untrustworthy, right? I remember talking to an editor who I'm very close with, uh, and this was during the Trump administration, and it was about he had, the president had attacked four congresswomen of color. He said they should go back to the crime-infested countries where they came from. No one wants them here, blah, blah, blah. First and foremost, these, these women had almost all been born in the United States of America, countries where they came from was America. But second, this was obviously and clearly a xenophobic attack. It was, it was racist. And the editor and I were talking, and she goes, well, you know, so many of our readers, they don't like the term racist, or they don't agree on what it means, and so if we use it, won't, won't they trust us less than if we just describe what he said? And I said, well, you know, but I've got a black grandmother who's 90 years old, and if something is clearly, objectively, obviously racist, and I refuse it to describe it as such, will that make her trust me more or less? That trust is subjective. Whose trust are we seeking? Because there are people who, by pulling that punch, by refusing to describe something clearly racist as racist, who perhaps who we are playing to. But there are other people who say, if you won't, if you won't tell me the truth about what's happening, then I don't trust you either. And so I think that that becomes... I, I think that remains at the core, right? I think it's one of the reasons whose trust are we seeking? And and I think that when we bend over backwards to project ourselves as being neutral or project ourselves as being balanced, I actually think we end up doing the types of things that lose trust with all of those groups. Mm. <laughs> we're seeking the trust of one group and we don't, we're not even getting. Mm. The book documents six incidents of white violence against ethnic minorities. And... I don't wish particularly to to delve into the exact detail or of what exactly happened to those people. In, in fact, I've made a deliberate choice. I've shied away from it during the course of this conversation. Mm -hmm. But I wondered if perhaps to close, you'd be able to talk a little bit about one of those six people, about one of the victims, about who they were, um, to give us kind of a sense of the humanity of, of, of these people that are subject to this racism. Of course. I mean, I, I think a lot about, I think a lot about Marcelo Lucero. Um, he's an Ecuadorian American man who was murdered just days after Barack Obama was elected. He'd come to the country at a time where this increased agitation was increasing, where our debate about immigration was at the forefront, where people like him were being dehumanized and degraded, and by no fault of his own, falls victim to the outpouring of this type of white lash. I think that it's too easy for us to, in our conversations, throw up our hands and say, what are we supposed to do? Politicians are political, they demonize, they engage in this hyperbolic rhetoric, and this is just how it works. And we can't hold politicians accountable for the things they say and how they do them, because what are you, anti-free speech? And aren't you? I think we have to engage more critically and honestly and skeptically about and really grapple with this question of what do we do when our values end up clashing? When we value as a society speech and the ability to debate and the ability to say unpopular things. But what do we do with people who would use that freedom and that value to openly and actively threaten the lives of other people? How do we hold the value of speech as well as the value of equality and equity and human dignity? How do we hold them together? Right, and what I would suggest is that in this moment, as well as in other moments of this type of white lash, we've seen people who have weaponized our value of speech as a means of trying to undermine our value of, of human equality and dignity. And that those of us who work within our liberal institutions, and I mean that in the classic way, in the press, in the, you know, like, have to do a better job of, of safeguarding this value of, of human dignity and human equality. We know that when you attack people based on who they are and their demographics, we know that leads to violence. We know that level of dehumanization leads to violence. 
And yet, we allow politicians to come on our airwaves and, and do it over and over and over again. We throw up our hands and pretend as if there's nothing we can do and nothing we can say. And, and I just think in this moment, there's been a real failing of many of our institutions to thoughtfully grapple with what our role is in curating our public square. That's not to say that we have the power to rid the world of these ideas or keep people from sharing them or having them, right? But there's something far different uh, from someone standing on the street corner uh, spouting off vile anti-Semitism and that person then being put on television <laughs> almost 24-7, their lies repeated on our social media feeds and in our newspapers, right? And, and I think that collectively we all could have done a much better job in the decade that, that has just passed and, and need to do a much better job in the decade that, that is approaching uh, to make sure that we have clarity about these prejudices and what they lead to. If Marcelo Lucero lived in a world where, where there was more responsible political rhetoric, he would likely still be living. And, and, and so I think we have to understand that while race is a biological fiction, racism is deadly real and has real consequences. And those of us who believe in the power of language and the power of communication and the power of words, that cuts in both directions. And when we allow poison into our public square, into, the, in, into our, into our, into our uh, bloodstream, we shouldn't be surprised when people start dropping dead. Buzzy Lowry, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. I really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks so much for having me.